the only way you can generate a large amount of money in a short period of time is to basically set, have your own business. Sai, I'm Kid. Welcome back on the podcast. How's it going today? Uh, yeah, great. Thanks for having me back. It's been, yeah, as, as we said, four years since we last spoke. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. I remember interviewing you like in the very beginning of our podcast, like episode, uh, I don't know, 50 something. So it's been a while. Yeah. It's been a long time. So for people that don't, don't know you at all, tell people who you are and just a bit of background about yourself to begin with. I started trading when I was 18 um, and I lost a, a stupid amount of money for the first four years and it took me about six years to get profitable so uh, yeah four years of hell two years of break even ish um and then yeah from year six onwards it's, it's been great so that's i guess my trading style and i've always um been balancing trading with my career and all that sort of stuff so like everyone does really and i guess it's just trial and error i've, I've the only way i've got good over time is just by knowing what idiot mistakes not to do so I'm nothing special. I'm really quite dumb. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. Interesting. I remember the first time we discussed about the idea of having a, a trading business and other businesses on the side too, to be able to fund your trading, which is something I've done in the, in the future myself. So the next few years after that, let's kind of talk about training first and we can go into the business aspect more later. But how did you get into training exactly? What happened for you to be jumping into the market? In the first place i'm quite lazy by nature so when i was 18 i was like how can i make money on my laptop in bed in my underwear and two things came up it was like online gambling and online trading trading seemed a bit scary so i thought gambling it can't be that hard um <laughs> and i thought i've got a system here and i now know it's called the martingale system so i was literally doing online roulette red or black and it was yeah and I made a lot of money very quickly and then I lost it all and a lot more even quicker. So I think my gambling, online gambling career lasted about a week and there was me, an 18 year old that ran up six, five or six grand of debt on credit cards. And I was like, oh. and for an 18 year old, that was a lot of money. Yeah, I stopped that and I thought, okay, this is gambling. No one can gamble, gamble properly. And then I thought, okay, let's try trading. And then I lost a lot more, a lot more money. At the same time, I, was, I joined the military, so I was becoming an Air Force pilot. And I had this, I was really bad at money management. So I, I had this system where I was earning, I was taking home about £2,200 a month. I was blowing two grand a month on the markets. That was literally how bad at trading I was. I was literally losing two grand a month from trading. And I was blowing 200 quid a month on booze and alcohol and partying. So that's the sort of image of how bad I was at life <laughs> back then. But it was fun. So. so what made it all turn around? What was the, the changing moment then? I just got fed up of losing. Like the yo-yo, yeah. So my profit equity curve was just a massive yo-yo, massive wins because my risk management was diabolical. I'd, I'd be having these huge wins and massive losses. Like I remember I was, what, 23 years old. So this was, yeah, about five years into it. I, I ran up an account. It was like eight or 10 grand account. And I ran up to 80 grand. I thought, oh, amazing. At this rate, I'm going to be a millionaire in a month's time, etc. I thought, oh, I'm going to turn this 80 grand into 800 grand. Um, and then I quickly lost about 20 grand in like one day. And I was like, oh. And then I was like, mm, okay, screw this. Um, and I, I plowed the remaining 60 grand into an Aston Martin which is just, it's just so stupid. Like looking at everything I did under the age of 25, I, I cringed massively. So there I was, I decimated my trading account in terms of capital because it was all in that stupid Aston. And I was back to like a, a five, 10 grand trading account. And then I, I fell into that trap. I was like, right, I'm making roughly two grand a month for my Air Force salary. I need to make two grand a month for my trading. From a 10 grand account, that's like trying to do 20% a month. You, you could probably do it one month or two maybe, but you're not going to con consistently do that. So yeah, eventually, I think somewhere along the line, I just got fed up of losing. I was like, right, I need to do this properly. Did you learn everything by yourself or did you have any mentor along the way to kind of guide you in the right direction? Just me. Just literally, yeah. I, I, I didn't even think of trying to find a mentor uh, back then. I guess I was too fixated on my Air Force career back then. Um, and I was just, I guess, 
I was a bit too cocky. I was like, oh, if I can fly planes and stuff, you know, trading is going to be easy. And I, I guess I was a bit too stubborn because I, I just refused to accept defeat. And then when I did accept defeat, finally, um, after, I guess it was a knockout blow. I ended up, I left the Air Force. So this was further, like, this was probably nine years ago where I left the Air Force prematurely. And I was like, I'm going to be a full-time trader because I sort of lulled myself into a false sense of security. I had like six or eight months of, you know, really good trading. I thought, ah, oh, I'm, you know, the dog's bollocks now. I'm going to be a full-time trader. And then like three months after leaving, quitting my job, I lost everything. I, 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 play, I, I can't remember what trade it was, but I lost, I blew my whole account. And then there was me applying for like shelf stacking jobs at Sainsbury's, Asda, Tesco, all that sort of, and they were all like rejecting me. I couldn't get a, a single job. Um, and yeah, it was just a bit shit. And then by, by necessity, because I was so fed up with losing, I was like, right, I'm going to massively, massively reduce my position sizes. Um, and then I just like, right, every trade, I'm going to risk like 0.1% max risk per trade. And then guess what? I stopped losing. Literally, there's one little thing that basically stopped the massive outflows of cash, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, I started focusing more on, you know, statistics, you know, expectancy, variance, um, all that sort of stuff. I'm curious to hear about the evolution of your trading style. So you probably begin trading manually. I'm guessing maybe day trading. And then how did that evolve over time? How did that change? Yeah, I think we all, we all start uh, dicking around on the one minute chart, don't we? <laughs> um so yeah i was i was day trading like scal in fact i was scalping that's what i was doing i was scalping on the one minute and five minute chart i was doing every wrong thing you could do really and then just as work got busier i then had to sort of escalate up to the higher time frames just because I, i couldn't chain myself to a screen and then i guess eventually i found my my groove my thing is trend trading i am a trend trader slash swing trader um And I was just looking at history. So when I started getting into this properly, as in like trying to learn properly, I realized that like over the last 300 years, one of the only methods on the markets that has consistently worked is trend trading. Like when you look at the big picture and you get a lot, there's a lot more money on the table through a big trend than a sideways market. Um, and you can be a bit more standoffish. So for example, if you're trading on the daily charts, um, Not much, or it, hell, even the four hour charts, you got like, you know, in a working day from like, you know, nine in the morning till six at night or whatever. Realistically, you're going to see like three candlesticks. So you enter a trade, you, you know, let's say in the morning, you come back from work and what's, what's, what's happened? Three, three new candles, let's say, or less. And so not much happens. So you can be a bit more reserved. And, mm. and so, yeah, I eventually found that, you know, the four hour and daily chart was my my time frame. Sometimes I'd execute on a, on a one hour chart to get a slightly more precise entry. Um, but then I'd be a, a trend trader, uh, or swing trader. And one of the things that's worked for me for, for almost a decade now really is to, I guess if I'm in a trend, so that we all, we all know the trend is your friend until the bend at the end. Yeah. Okay. Easier said than done. Um, but I've just always trailed my stop loss when I've got in a, in a trend using um, a form of moving average, whether it be a 21 moving average or, or whatnot. And I would always scale in. So that, that's the key. When you finally get your claws into a trend, you need to exacerbate that thing like no tomorrow. So as a trend trader, you're, you're constantly putting little jabs in the market, very low risk, like 0.25% max risk to try and get a position in, in, into a trend, like a potential new trend, so to speak. And when it's, you know, starting to trend up or down, doesn't matter. Um, you can then start scaling in. So for example, 2015 Black Monday crash. So on that day, I made about 426 grand in like half an hour. It was a great day trading wise. In terms of the account, it was the 30% uh, ROI day. So it was a great, great day. Um, but a lot of that profit was done on the Dow Jones, I think, off the top of my head. It was the Dow Jones and the, the pound and, and pound Kiwi. But when you look at the Dow, it only dropped, I don't know what, a thousand points, something like that. But throughout the whole day, I accumulated like 25,000 pips or 25,000 points and pips because I'm you know, doing two, two main things there. Um, 
And a lot of people's like, how the hell do you get 25,000 points when, you know, this market only moved a thousand points or, or pound Kiwi only went up 1500 pips. And it's because I scaled in like during that big old drop, I ended up with 20 plus trades. And so let's say one trade makes, <clears throat> you know, a thousand pips. The other trade will make 950 pips. Another one will make 900 pips, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, uh, I guess I'm waffling now. So did that sort of answer the question? Yeah, that makes sense. So you went from day trading to string trading with, with trends. And then how did the move from manual to automated trading happen? Yeah, that, that's a good question, actually. So I think everything's sort of converged into one thing. So I've been trying to get a trading bot working for about 10 years now. And it I failed massively. Like in my trading book, um, it's one of the things I say to avoid, like don't search for holy grail trading systems and also trading bots. 99.9% of them are just rubbish. Um, they're normally just some simple script, like if this happens, then do that. Or, or what we're seeing a lot on TradingView these days is that everyone can create, I mean, there's, it seems like since 2017, there's been an abundance of pretenders out there on the markets who yeah. They've, yeah. they've seen crypto go through the, the, through the roof. They've probably made a little bit of profit or loss on cryptos. And, they've, and TradingView in terms of popularity is excelled. And so there's been loads of people that have been able to create scripts on TradingView. And so you can create like an indicator, you know, when, you know, when this something, when this indicator does this, it'll, it'll give, it'll pop up, you know, a buy signal or a sell signal, et cetera. EAs have sort of flooded the markets. As if, if you've been around, you've probably seen, you know, every, there's all sorts of black box trading bots out there, et cetera. But when you, again, I look at everything from a first principles point of view, um, and like the highest level possible and then then go down into the weeds and so one of the questions i was asking myself is what is trading how do you profit on the market so and i boiled it down to two things trading is two things in my in my opinion the first thing is the easiest bit is getting a positively skewed system so you need a positively skewed so positive expectancy algorithm so a strategy which is positive okay but mathematically backed so that's the first thing. And that's the, the easiest bit, actually. I, I, <clears throat> I always thought it was the hardest, but it's not. It's the easiest thing. I could pluck out a new system out of my ass right now and I, I could make it profitable. Step two, once you've got your positively skewed system, you then have to execute it consistently and flawlessly over, over time in order to generate a large or a large enough data sample. So that is it. So once you have a mathematically or statistically backed system, you then got to execute it without deviating from the trading plan parameters etc so that that's so that that's trading in a nutshell get something which is profitable and then execute that thing now humans you and i we're we're clever monkeys at the end of the day and we are not the best traders really if you look at any sort of organism or species or thing to be to be good traders yeah we're better than monkeys but we're not better than computers. So here's the other thing. If you can create a positively skewed system, which is completely mechanical, so there's very little subjectivity there, because there's some systems where, you know, it could be some sort of like, let's take a MACD, a MACD crossover or whatever. Um, so some people go, oh yeah, this is a really good MACD crossover. Or someone else go, oh no, it's, it's not high enough or it's not low enough, etc. There's a bit of subjectivity there. And there's a lot of systems out there where it's sort of the traders are going, mm, this looks good, etc. So they're fine. And I've got some systems which, you know, you have to eyeball somewhat. But I prefer mechanical systems. So really, if this happens, then do that. But the, the thing which I've always missed with machine learning, or sorry, with bots, is machine learning. It's literally been in the last two years that um, machine learning has become more accessible. And that's the missing jigsaw puzzle, puzzle piece. So, so this is why like 99% of my trading now is done by my machine learning bot. Because um, it's got my system, which is profitable. It executes it flawlessly, um, 24 hours, five and a half days a week. And yeah, that, that's it. And the other thing, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that humans, we are eating, sleeping, working, like we spend most of our time away from the charts or not trading. And so we're missing out on 50 to 80% of valid setups, unless you're, you're becoming a screen slave. And I don't want to become a screen slave. Like why chain yourself to the charts? Because like you just bought yourself a job, a shitty job. <laughs> so 
the bot my bot just does all my trading now pretty much i agree with that so that's kind of what i've done myself also the past year and a half or so is going to more and more systematic things that can be applied anywhere anytime by a robot without being there to take the trades it just makes you answer the basic question so what is the difference between an algo and a machine learning algo what would be the difference there uh, okay so a non-machine learning algo would be if this happens then do this okay <clears throat> so it's going to be let's just keep things simple let's say it's a moving average crossover right when this moving average crosses over this sell when this moving average crosses over this buy okay so all the bot will be doing is will be looking for those crossovers and it will just place the trade regardless. Now you can, you can make it better so you can put exposure limits in. So, you know, the bot will know that if the, if, you know, you can limit it to one trade per currency pair, you could, you know, and you can have all the, you know, the risk, et cetera, and that sort of stuff. So you, you can get some good non machine learning ones, but I think, you've got to monitor them. You can't really fire and forget. You've really got to keep on, on top of them. Um, so that is a non machine learning based one. Now the, the key with the mach- so the, the main difference with a machine learning one is that it will adapt with it over time. So as more data comes in, the algorithm itself will change. So for example, if, if you code up, let's go back to that example, you've, you've put in a machine learning, uh, sorry, a uh, moving average crossover system, let's say. And I don't know, you could just say, right, the stop loss for this is one times ATR and a take profit is 2R, okay? So your bot will just always do 2R take profit and one times ATR as the stop loss. But what you could do with, if you have a system that is constantly learning, it's even better because there will be a whole bunch of trades where if you'd taken say a two, um, two times ATR, you wouldn't have got stopped out. Or if you'd taken a five R outcome, you know, you, you're either leaving profits on the table or you're missing out on stuff. So what we can do in my bot is that, yeah, you can select the markets and the time frames you want to choose. And you know, even the, the hours of the day that you want to place trades, etc. But the cool thing is that it has a massive data bank of, of raw data, as in all, all trading data for you know, 10 years, I'd say. And so instead of giving it a set to our li- you know, limit and let's say a set stop loss, you can actually put a range in. So you can put it, say, um, I would like a stop loss between zero to 200% t- of ATR. So zero to two ATR, let's say, or five ATR, whatever you want. And you can have a, a take profit of one R to five R. So what will then happen is that the bot will look for the setups of the core setup, like I know, let's say a moving average crossover, and then it will look at the market. So let's say it's found a trade on the one hour chart, euro dollar to go downwards, and it's got this sort of candlestick, let's say. It will then look in its data bank and go, right, <clears throat> how many other situations where this exact picture has occurred on the one hour chart in euro dollar with this candlestick formation with you know whatever other bits you want and it will look in and go right over the last 10 years there's 500 setups or identical setups to this particular thing and out of those 500 setups with you know this is what's happened so it'll then go ah okay in this case i'm gonna not me the bot will say i'm gonna place this trade with this stop loss so it will choose the stop loss you know anywhere between the you know whatever parameter you set and it will choose the take profit and it will know all the stats for it, whereas a human couldn't. We, that's effectively like us firing from the hips, but we wouldn't know the expectancy of it. The, so with that, it will have a probability becoming profitable, there's blah. Um, it also has an expectancy filter as well. So that's crucial. So, so for example, it will look at all, so you could set a, a filter in your bot saying, right, I only want trades with a minimum of a 0.1 expectancy, minimum. So what that will then do is if this euro dollar trade comes up, it'll look at the 500 odd previous trades and go, ah, oh, okay. Yeah. On average with this setup, with this stop loss and limit, it averages 0.15 expectancy. So then it'll place the trade. But if it does, if it's less than 0.1 expectancy, it won't place the trade. Whereas a human, like how, if we see a setup, we have no idea if this setup, like it could be a perfect looking setup because you and I are simple monkeys and we're looking for a crossover. We won't have a clue of if the, you know, we won't know what the expectancy of that setup is, would we? 
we would just place it because we're looking for a crossover. There's a crossover. It looks pretty good. We'll place it. So, so it's, it's a difference between having something that's constantly automating itself and becoming better as opposed to doing yourself all the practicing, the data, getting in. So. So the fact that it chooses the best stop loss based on data, mm -hmm. the best, or it chooses whatever you want it to choose, really. Um, is it, so we got this running with about 2018, and we did a three-way split test. So I set up the bot. So with any form of algo creation, the, once you've put your stake in the ground and gone, right, this is it, um, and it may look good in back testing. I mean, you can make anything look good in back testing, really, if you curve fit and all that sort of stuff. But there's always an element of you have no idea how well it's going to walk forward. So you have to do real time walk forward. So we did it, it looked great, it was all fine. And it's a system that I've been using manually for ages. So I knew it worked because if it works for me manually, it's going to work better on the bot. Um, So we then did the bot running on its own, the bot with me tweaking, thinking I know better, and then me manually trading that algorithm, that system. The bot left me for dust. And my manual trading just got, it was profitable by the end of the, that year, but not as good. The bot of me tweaking with it came second and the bot left alone just by a country mile was better. Because when I was tweaking with the bot, it would be asking, it would be sending me a telegram alert saying, hey, here's a setup, would you like me to play it? place a trade with a yes and a no button i'd be like nah i know better no and guess what you know <laughs> me playing around with it was not as good so i've got it on full full autopilot now so it just play finds places and trades everything and it just sends me a telegram saying hey i've done this for someone that wants to go into creating an algo for his trading is there a big bar of entry to using artificial intelligence for the algo or is it pretty simple to apply and use massive massive bar Like, I'm not a coder, so I don't have a clue when it comes to coding. Um, I don't even, I personally don't even know how to create a simple script. Like, that's how bad at tech and stuff I am. I, I'm just a trader. Um, <clears throat> so finding someone that knows their shit is actually really hard. Because if you go to, like, most people go to upwork.com and put in an ad for, I'm looking for a trading coder. And you'll have... A million different people saying that they can all do the same thing and when you're trying to scope up a, a new project like this you'll have some people that come back and say oh yeah i can do your thing it'll cost you five grand fine some people come back and go mm, actually with your scope it's going to cost 500 grand and it, for someone that knows nothing about coding i mean it's good that i know about trading so i can i can i have a bullshit detector straight away when it comes to trading stuff but i have no bullshit detector when it comes to coding i haven't got a clue do i take this person's quote to be five grand or 500 grand Like common sense will say probably the 500 grand is going to be a bit safer than the five grand one. But do you really want to spend 500 grand? Not yeah. So, and like, I've got a bunch of businesses and we, <clears throat> and I mean, I recruit all sorts of different people for different jobs, etc. And I've done, you know, and I've recruited a whole bunch of remote working people in the past. And even for a simple thing, like you could recruit like a graphic designer, which I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but there are billions of graphic designers out there, right? It's a commoditized skill now. I don't know if you looked at the market, but every, yeah. every man and his dog is a graphic designer or a logo designer these days. And so with that, especially if you're hiring, let's say I'm in the UK, like you could get a graphic designer for like $5 an hour from somewhere in the East, let's say. And, and, You can have, yeah, two of them. And one could be absolutely amazing. One could be useless. And yeah, so you've got to kiss a lot of frogs, unfortunately. And you've got to be super specific with your brief. Super specific. So that's where a lot of people go wrong in the scope. So, mm -hmm. And that so can be tough for someone who's only trading before and not really having a business. That can be tough to start to hire people, get a programmer, get this person, next person to be able to work on something. That, yeah. that can be tough. So... Uh, did you feel nervous at first to dive into this or did you kind of know where you were headed? I failed massively, literally. I, I wouldn't even recommend it. So if you're just, so first of all, if you're, if you don't fully know trading, I wouldn't even bother doing it because you, you need to have a massive good grasp of trading, especially trading statistics and probabilities. Like you need to know what expectancy is inside and out. You need to know what variance is and, you know, all the different trading metrics that you may need. Like, I'm, I'm still surprised that people don't know, like my two favorite stats, trading stats are average adverse excursion and favorable um, 
uh, average favorable excursion. Um, and like, if you know these two stats of like, you can tweak those two and you will turbocharge your own, your strategy like overnight. But how do you use those stats? You can't do that unless you've got a good data sample of stats behind you. And how do you do that? You need to log. So you need at least a hundred trades under your belt doing one method. And then you can apply those, those metrics to those, you know, to that system. But 99% of traders out there don't log. So they'll never be able to, you know, tweak their, their strategies because they're always shooting from the hips. So let's talk about business a little bit. So how do you combine trading and business? How do you manage your time to be able to do both? It's hard to begin with. So in fact, business actually saved my trading because up until I got into business, I was always relying on stripping out my account to pay for bills. Like I was full-time day trading and I had all the profits of my trading had to go to pay the rent, the utility bills, all my outgoings. And that absolutely sucked because there's pressure from day one. And if you don't make your ROI in that month, you're screwed. You're like, I can't pay the rent because I've lost money this month. I haven't made money. So when I started relying on my income from my businesses, then I, I just stopped trying to strip my trading account. And I was like, right, I'm, the money in my trading account, I'm just going to let grow and compound. So it took a lot of the pressure off. And then the thing is, with, with businesses, the way I have it is that I've got my group of companies up here where I don't even see this yet, group of companies up here. So they make all profits. And then I siphon the profits from my trading uh, from my businesses into investments or trading and investing. So, so basically where I think a lot of people go wrong is that they, they get into trading, think it's going to be an income replacement. When I think personally, my own opinion hat on is that I, I think that is the worst thing you could ever do. Trading should not be uh, an income replacement. It should be, a wealth grower. So all it does is trading grows whatever capital I have. And I've met, and I was in this situation, you probably have been in at some point and I've met so many good traders out there. So people have been trading for, you know, three, five, 10 years, and they can make a really good ROI percentage wise. You know, I've met some good traders, you know, they've got, you know, a two year, three year track record and they've consistently done 10, let's say 10, 15% a year. So they're a good trader, but because they're trading a 10 grand account, if you're making a grand a year profit from trading, you can't live off that, can you? And so one of the things that was a frustration because I got myself to a position where I was a, gr a good trader making good ROI from trading. But if I'm making hell, even 20% a year on a 10 grand account, like two year, two grand a year profit is bugger all. So one of the reasons I got into business is like, shit, I need a way to actually put more money in my trading account hence business. And then I lost massively business for the first four businesses. <laughs> I lose big time on everything I do to begin with. So, But that's the learning curve. So, and I was in a similar situation a few years ago to where I wanted to be able to go full-time trading and I had some, some good, some good returns and everything around, but I, I didn't have the capital to do it. And I had to find a yeah. way to either, I, I knew some guys from people that worked 10 years to be able to save enough money to be able to trade full-time after. And I didn't want to have to work 10 years full time in a job to be able to do that. So yeah, that's what I mean, came into you know, Yeah. If you've got a couple of hundred grand in your trading account, yeah, you can easily live off it, mm -hmm. but not on 10 grand. Hell, if you, even if you've got 50 grand in your account, uh, you should not live off that. No, no. So, Cause then your, your returns just be your bill and that's it. Paying the bills and a holiday at best. I guess if you're in that quagmire, you've only got two options. So let's say you are, um, so obviously I'm now talking to a very small group of people here, but let's say you are a good trader. You're, you're consistently good. You know what you're doing, but you haven't got much money in your trading account. You've only got two options. You either get into business and you grow your business empire or your mini ecosystem, or you grow a business or two or whatever. Um, so you can scale up your trading account via your business. But remember that is a short, every solution is going to be a, a medium to long-term solution, by the way. Um, so that's one way you can do it. And that's how I did it. Or you can try and get a two to three year track record on a live account. So even if you've got five, 10 grand in your account, if you trade that consistently for that, let's say at least two years and you document everything. So you, every single trade you, um, 
So every single trade you place, you need an entry and an exit screenshot. Uh, you need to doodle yeah, and then print them out. So what you'll end up having is that every year you'll have this massive lever arch folder of, let's say you place, I don't know, 100 trades in a year. You should have at least 100 pieces of paper with the entry and the exit screenshot with doodles, the reason why you got in, all that sort of stuff. And every month you have another, you know, like an overall summary of each month, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, maybe a whole year summary. Basically have stats up the yin yang. Um, <clears throat> and then also in that folder, have your broker generated report. Okay. So this is airtight. You can go, right, 2018 or whatever. This is my trading this year. This is basically your trading journal and all of the results. And, you know, put them in, you know, make it nice. And so let's say you've got two years worth of this meticulous logging, right? Two big old lever arch folders. What you then do, what you should, what I think you could then do is go to an accounting firm, make it a big one, someone that's heard of, whatever, PwC, and get it assayed. So what they won't do is go, yeah, we get, we can confirm that Etienne is a good trader. They won't do that because there's lots of liability that comes with a statement like that. But what you can get them to say is, can you please audit or verify that this broker generated report matches my own log as in my, my own you know um stats and reports etc does that make sense yeah so yeah. then they will simply go they'll do their thing they'll go yeah they'll go you, you you may have to teach them how to go line by line here's trade one this is the result this is this matches in my own personal log blah 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 and then you can get some sort of stamp saying yeah it's assayed and authenticated or audited by PwC. And then once you've got all that, then you go on a, uh, a capital raise. So then you need to either whore yourself out or whore out the, you know, your, your stats go to prop houses, banks, uh, high net worth investors, even try and go down the CF30 route to become a, an, or a proper a money manager. You can run an FCA or if you don't want to go down the FCA route, you can actually do um, a PAM account. You familiar with the PAM account? No, perhaps not. In order to run an FTA regulated fund, there's a good three years of hoop jumping and exams and qualifications that you need to do. It's a massive ball ache. It'll cost a fair bit of money just to get all your accreditations. But there is, I guess, a tiny shortcut route. And again, this is I'm now talking to a very small group of people. Um, I mean, you could probably do it. You can find... There are companies out there where they are... Um, I guess they're umbrellas, the FCA umbrellas. So they are FCA regulated and they have the ability to set up a new fund. Okay. So what they do is let's call it X company. So this X company is the umbrella. They're FCA regulated. They'll have um, an, an approved person there who is able to do that. And they'll set up a fund of like a new, like a tra they, they can set up a trading account and put money in it. Okay. But then they'll employ you and you would just be the executor of that account. So you'll just be the, the, the trader for that that fund so you'd be operating under their regulated umbrella um i did that in 2015 and, and that was quite good and so when i say a pam account so what you have i hate using the forgive me the terminology it's not 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 my terminology you're you would be trading a main trading account which is called the master account and then what this firm can do is get high net worth investors whatever to invest in that fund and they would basically what would happen is that they could ha have their own trading account, put their own money in that their own account, but it would be connected to the master account. So they'd have a slave account. You'd have a master account. And yeah, it's uh, I think Pam is percentage allocation money module module money. So yeah. So if I risk 1% on a trade on my master account or risk 1%, on their account, etc. So, so you got to get this different, different traders, basically. Yeah, and you can take okay. percentage. Yeah, I did that in 2015. So again, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Is it way, one way to scale your trading? Because I did that. So in 2015, I was running. It started off like 1.4 million pounds, and then I did it for 11 months. And at the end of the 11 months, I grew it to six. Uh, I did 61% ROI. So it was a great year, or 11 months of trading. But I stopped after that because, man, it was stressful. You'd have people texting you every day. Why the hell do you place that trade? I'm like, just go away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, interesting. Oh, yeah. Sorry, now, it's a long month. No, it's, it's it's good to know for sure. Now, one thing I know is some people will say that they they don't want to have a business because they're gonna to have to be too involved. It's gonna to be too much work for them, and they want to dedicate their time on trading. So, 
I know your kind of business is different. So you have businesses that you don't necessarily work day to day in them. You kind of buy them and then run them a little bit. So how does that work exactly? What exactly do you do with those businesses and how do you proceed with that? There's a few questions there. So first of all, I would recommend to everyone that they need to just give, like if they're not prepared to set up a business, run, set up, run, grow uh, and sell a business, then I can't really help you because if you're not prepared to put in the hard work now to make the, the living or selling easier in the future, then let's say trading is your thing. You really want to do well at trading uh, and you, you end up being good. Like you have to scale your account somehow. You have to. So you either go down the official route and become a money manager, etc., and try and find investors or whatever, which is a shitty route. I, I, I recommend not, that you don't do it. I've, I've done it. Or the other way is to stay private and basically try and come up with funds your, your own way. And the, the only way you can generate a large amount of money in a short period of time is to basically set, have your own business. You, you're going to have to go through that rigmarole. So all the pain and whatever you went through with trading, you're going to go through a business. Like, I, like, yeah, my first three businesses didn't work. And it was lucky number four. But then once you get the hang of business, then it's not risky anymore. So, I, so with trading, it's all about R multiples, right? So like if you always take, say, 3R outcomes, 3R trades, I mean, you can be wrong like 25% of the time and break even. And because I'm a trend trader, trend trading has historically or typically a low hit rate. So uh, some of my trend trading methods have like a 35% hit rate. But because, I'm minimum, because my minimum R multiple is three, it doesn't matter, I'm still in profit. Um, and so I looked at business with the same sort of mindset and said, well, I heard that if, you know, for new business owners, you have a nine out of 10 chance of failing. I was like, well, okay, I'm just going to set up 10 different businesses. One of them is going to work. And the R multiple of business is better than any trade you'll ever take. I promise you. If you, that one business that will work, let's say you can get that business, you know, small, let's say you can, you can get it to doing 50 grand a year profit. I mean, that would be a tiny micro nano business. But 50 grand a year profit times, let's say you run it for five years, that's what, 250 grand. How much does it set, take to set up the business? It will probably most likely it would cost you less than five or 10 grand to set up the business. What's the R multiple of that? Higher than any trade you'll ever take. And then fast forward, like in my situation, so I've, you know, I've got a whole bunch of businesses. So the thing, so the thing you need to do when you, when you sort of get along the business route is that you need to get them running semi-autonomously. So you need staff. That is the key thing. The moment I started employing staff, this is the, this is the moment I started breaching through my sort of glass ceilings. So I have zero operational involvement with all of my businesses. Like I haven't got a clue. Someone will, will email me say, Hey, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Pfft. I'd have to ask my ops manager. So you need a team running the business for you and you need to be the director. And a director of a business does not dick about doing, you know, admin stuff. Like a, a, a director of a business should only be doing two things, um, planning the future of the business and doing revenue generating activities at the end of the day, JVs or, you know, whatever. So yeah, I guess one thing you should always do is if you ever find yourself dicking about doing things you really shouldn't just always sit back and go, right, what revenue generating things can I do today in my business? Or if you don't have a business, what revenue generating skills can I learn? I mean, <clears throat> a lot of people spent, are happy to spend 50 grand getting a uni, uni degree, but what is the ROI on a uni degree? Most of the days you'll end up doing a job completely irrelevant to your degree. Um, I've got one of my web pages. I've got the stats of something like the average salary five years after your degree and it's like less than 30 grand and it's like what so people have no qualms getting 50 grand in debt to get a job less than 30 grand a year but they're not prepared to spend five grand setting up a business or let's say let's say you got 20 grand and you're like okay i'm gonna spend five grand on each business i, I i'm gonna go off on one uh, i've gone off on one <laughs> this is true and one thing you mentioned which i can relate on is the idea of focusing on the things that produce results deep in computing activities. So after that, like the past two years for training in business, and I think you find the two in the same thing in both. Like in training, this thing is like mostly people spend their time looking the, at, at, at strategies online. They read blogs, which is a waste of time. And so you can cut that, you can work on things that produce results. People spend time like, trying new strategies, it's a waste of time too. And same thing in business, of course. So you can kind of cut a lot of things. And sometimes 
people think they're busy, but they're not that busy in the end. It's just like they waste time a lot. So, yeah, so, so true. If you are getting into business or if you have a business, like, again, look at everything from a first principles point of view, as in a massive top down picture. If you have a business, you need sales, right? How do you get sales? You, you get leads. Okay, how do you get leads these days? Um, online. I mean, you can do it offline, but you can't scale that. You can't control that. So online, okay, online. Okay, well, how do you get online leads or leads online or there's online marketing? And you would be surprised how many business owners haven't got a clue about online marketing. And so one of the things that I had to bite the bullet years ago was I realized this. I was like, oh, shit, if I'm going to do well in business, I actually have to understand online marketing. So the only thing I've actually ever paid for, I, mean, I never paid a penny to learn how to trade, but I have then quickly spent over a hundred grand in learning online marketing. So I've done all sorts of seminars, business courses, business workshops, all that sort of stuff, trying to accelerate my learning time because I didn't want to spend six years trying to figure out marketing because that's, you know, time cost there. So I spent, you know, two or three years ma- like rapidly learning everything from the best I could find. And then once you understand online marketing, then obviously you need to implement that in your business. But again, you shouldn't be dicking around with it. You should find someone to implement. You need a digi marketer in your team. And because you'll then have a knowledge, you'll, you'll know who to recruit because you, you'll, you'll have all the BS detectors out there. How do you manage money in your business to be able to invest in your trading? Do you put like all the profit in trading or do you put do you sit, like separate in, in fractions, what you keep for yourself, what you put in the business? How does that work? It becomes a bit of a cluster mess. So I've got eight businesses now. Um, I had more, but I've got rid of some. But um, so what I've, you end up with lots of different accounts. So I, with a bunch of the businesses, I have corporate trading accounts with each. I use FXCM just, I've, I've used them for about 10 years. It's just a really good broker. Um, and the, I love the charting platform. So every trade, well, not every, most of the companies have a corporate trading account. So I can actually just put money into a, a trade, like a, um, an FX trading account. So that's one thing I do. I just take big profits really. So, so I, I put myself on a, on, um, I have a salary and then I take lots of big divvies. So, and then, so the money then comes to me personally and then I trade. So actually most of my trading accounts are actually in my own personal name because I, I do financial spread betting because uh, I'm in the UK. So all my profits are tax free, but a company, don't forget a company is a, a, an entity Like you are an entity and a limited company is an entity. So imagine a company as a, as a person. So, a company needs its own assets. So everyone is so obsessed with becoming financially free or financially independent, like as you as a person, but which, which is great. A lot of business owners, they, they're obsessed with getting themselves financially independent, but at at the predicament of their business. So what they do is they, they strip and choke their business to try and get the profits out of their business for themselves, but they, they leave their business vulnerable. So what you need to imagine is that your business is a real person and that you need to make that business financially independent. So the quicker you can get your business financially independent, as in, you know, it's, it's on its feet, um, so it has, you know, consistent revenue from day one, um, then the quicker you personally will become wealthy. So for example, um, you can create some form of residual income stream, like a subscription based type income with any type of business, whether you have an online business a bricks and mortar business, get some sort of subscription or payment plan type product in there because, and then let's say your outgoings are, I know 10 grand a month in your business. Well, then your first goal is right. I need to make sure that my direct debit income or my payment plan income hits 10 grand a month. That's your first goal. The moment you're, you know, guarantee your residual income in your business meets your outgoings. That's a massive weight of your shoulders because on day one, every month, like all your outgoings are covered. Everything else is profit. Whereas if you don't day one of every month, it's like, geez, I need to make 10 grand in sales or 12 grand in sales or whatever, just to break even. So there's pressure there. It's a bit like trying to trade, you know, trade from your own trading account to pay your own bills. It's yeah. So, so once I've done that, then remember your business is an actual entity. Your entity needs investments. So take your profits and then you and take those profits and buy stuff. So for example, if you 
I don't post a lot of profits. Obviously, I take dividends from my companies, but I don't post that much profit. So what I'll do three months before the year end, I'll, I'll look at my accounts and go, right, I've made this month much amount of profit. Now, if I do nothing and I, and I wait till the end of the year and I post those profits officially, I'll then have to pay corporation tax on that of what, you know, every country has different corporation tax. Now, corporation tax is basically you being inefficient with your, with your money. So what I'll then do, I'll then give myself three months to disperse that profit. So at the end, but so by the end of the year, I, let's say, you know, it doesn't matter whether you've got a million pounds or 10 grand, let's say it's a million, right? If you've got a million pounds of profits and let's say you've got 20% corporation tax in your country or whatever, like you've got to pay 200 grand in tax. Like that 200 grand is better off in your pocket than the tax man. So what I then do is go, right, how can I get rid of a million pounds of profit over the next three months or six months or, you know, whatever. And so one way to do that is you can either go out and buy property. So your company can go out and buy property. There's all sorts of cool SaaSs out there. So um, company pension schemes out there. So a SaaS is really effective. Um, or what I find is even better, just plow it all into marketing. Literally. Just plow it all into Google or Facebook or wherever your main um, lead generation is. Because if, you, if you've got a, a, a marketing sit machine which is you know somewhat okay if you plow a million pounds into it okay that you got rid of all your profit for that year which is great but you're going to get that money back but more hopefully <laughs> again I, I could talk for a long time about money management with the businesses but uh, again the average person i mean it's common knowledge you need a rainy day fund right you know everyone needs a rainy day fund you know a pot of money so that if the boiler breaks or your car breaks down you can cover that right um, but do the same with your business. Jeez, have at least six months worth of outgoings in cash. Now that may be a lot. Like the bigger the business you get, six months worth of OPEC, so operational expenditure, is a lot of money. So let's say you've got a business that's doing, you know, it has even 10 grand a month in outgoings. That means you've got 60 grand in cash sat in your bank account, burning a hole in your pocket. And as a trader, especially like you're, you're a trader, if you're a trader or an investor, there's a, a Someone that there's that little bastard on your shoulder going, there's 60 grand in your account doing nothing. You need to grow it. (laughs) So this is where I've screwed myself over. You know, I've sat there going, oh, you know, there's a couple hundred grand in the account. there doing nothing. And in one side of your head's going, yeah, but it's my rainy day fund. If, you know, something bad happens, I've got, you know, payroll or I I can pay my staff for six months or, you know, whatever. But the other one's like, well, yeah, well, why don't you grow it? You know? 60 grand, you could grow that into 100 grand. And then, but where I've gone wrong is I've taken my rainy day fund and I've put it into illiquid assets, which, which is shit. Like, yeah. And so guess what? The rainy day comes and you need that money. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. I've parked it into an illi- illiquid asset. I can't get it out. And guess what? You end up borrowing money to cover the shortfall. So don't be too tempted. So if you, yeah, so all I do, so here's, um, if you do have a rainy day fund in your business at, yeah, invest it, grow it, but put it in, in liquid assets. So for me, I just put it in my trading bot because <laughs> I can withdraw the money whenever I want. Good point. Good. Some good lessons about trading and then business and, and money. So that's pretty awesome. So what can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out after this podcast? If you type Siam Kid into YouTube, I put loads of stuff on YouTube for free. Um, but I'm at therealistictrader.com if you want to find me. And, awesome. yeah, and you can play my bot as well there as well. So. Sam, it's been a pleasure. I know your advice is always pretty good. People love it. So I had a logo to back about the first interview we did together a few years ago. It's going to be the same for this one, of course. And I hope to talk to you soon. Uh, Thanks for having me.